I'm a social professor at Leiden University in the Netherlands. I'm on Twitter as well. So if people are still on Twitter, my Twitter handle is my first name. It's at Felina, as you see uh, on the slide here. So if you want to tweet about this talk, then be sure to mention me so I, I can look up all the nice tweets later. As was already introduced, my talk today is about how to read code, specifically how to read complex code. But before we're gonna dive into that, I want to take you into my own personal history of how I got interested in how people read code. So we have to go back to the year 2013, which is when I started to teach kids programming. There was a bunch of kids at a community center in Rotterdam, also in the Netherlands where I lived at the time, and they were in need of a programming teacher. And I was like, sure, that sounds fun, children. I can teach you programming. That's not a problem at all. Even though I, I didn't know anything about teacher, teaching. I had just graduated my PhD in software engineering, so I knew programming, uh, but I didn't really know anything about teaching. Uh, but I was like, well, they're kids, right? They, they were like nine, 10, 11. How, how hard can it be? They're, they're tiny children. So I'm sure I can win this, even though I don't know anything about teaching. And then what, what sort of happens, no, not explicitly, but subconsciously, is I started to look back at how I learned programming when I was a kid. So this is me when I was about 10 years old behind my dad's huge computer. I was very small and computers at the time were really, really large. Teaching myself programming because I didn't have a teacher or a parent, no adult, no new programming where I lived at the time. So I didn't have a programming lesson. I had books. This book, specifically what I had, the book called Basic Computer Games. And this was a book allegedly teaching people programming, but it wasn't so much a book with explanations. If you, if you open up this book, this is what's in there. So this is just printed out basic codes, pages and pages and pages. And you would just copy that manually into your computer. And as I guess you can hear from how I talk English, uh, English is not really my first language. And when I was 10, I spoke no English. So not only did basic have no meaning to me, also English had no meaning to me. I really didn't understand uh, what was in the book, you know, what was apps and prints and next. I just mindlessly copied everything. And after a while, of course, I, I did uh, develop a sense of what the what programming was all about so that's how i learned programming not from a teacher not from a lesson but mainly by teaching myself and it's not just me many people my age so let's say children of the 80s have learned programming this way because at the time there were not many adults that told programming there wasn't programming in schools there weren't like coder dojos and youtube and the stuff that you have today so this idea of not really knowing what a programming lesson looks like is very much a programming community thing. And that leads to people that start teaching like I did, sort of mimicking this experience. I definitely didn't do this on purpose, but I was thinking, oh, you know, kids don't need explanations. They don't need a lesson from me. What they need is books with programming codes and then they can just copy that into the computer and that's the way they learn programming. I didn't really think of it in the, those full sentences, but that was definitely the vibe that I was going for. So that's what I did. I went to a bookshop and I bought everything that said programming for children. I brought the books to the programming club. If you look at those books that you can buy today, so not a basic games book, but books that are actually in bookshops now, you can see that those books are written by people like me, that they also learned programming in this exploratory fashion, and then they became programmers, and then they became probably parents, and then programming for kids authors. So let's look at a few of those books, and let's also investigate what image those books present to children that want to learn programming. For example, the best part of programming is finding mistakes. That's, that's sort of a weird sentiment, right? I mean, I love programming, but is the best part of programming finding mistakes? M maybe fixing mistakes, maybe. But finding mistakes? Like half of the time, I'm the person that put in the mistakes. I don't love finding mistakes. It makes me hate myself. So if you say like the best part of programming is, is finding mistakes, it's sort of 
it says something about what kind of person you are. Here's another one. Programmers only learn from making mistakes. And it's a bit vague what exactly this means. Whether this means if there's a mistake, you can only learn from it, or mistakes are the only source of learning. Even in, in the Dutch original, it, this is a bit vague. But this is also weird, right? Because there are many things that mistakes can result in. Yes, they can result in learning, but they can also result in people giving up. People are like, well, <laughs> I don't like programming. I'm just going to do something else with my precious childhood. You will fail often and it will be frustrating. That's also kind of special, right? Especially for this age group. So these are, again, 10, 11, 12 year olds that these books are marketed at. Yeah, sure, programming, learning anything will be hard and you will fail often. Like these are kids that have already learned to ride a bike or uh, use a, sk a skateboard or something. Of course, they know that learning can also include failing and, and not giving up. But it's sort of weird to put this in a book. If you have a book, mm, soccer for kids or something, then it will probably say, oh, if you, want, if you practice really hard and you, can do, you too can be Megan Rapinoe or Lionel Messi, it will emphasize practicing and it will not say, well, learning soccer will be really frustrating, even though clearly also learning soccer, like learning anything, will be hard. Never be afraid to mess around and experiment. Right? This is a person that had such a book like me and thought, okay, I think I know what I'm doing. Let's experiment to deepen my knowledge. So, of course, this is not a bad thing, but it's sort of weird also in the context of programming because the same snippet also says, break the rules. Break the rules, children. But also, here's Python, same book. Here's Python. A colon goes there, and a rectangular bracket goes there, and a round bracket goes there, and a curly bracket goes there. Python, for people that don't know this, Python is so precise that if you put a space in the wrong place, then Python crashes. So break the rules is not bad advice, but it entirely overlooks the fact that there are certain rules, like syntax, that you have to obey. So if, if you say to a child, break the rules, you know what some kids will do? Oh, let's, let's try a hundred opening brackets. This is fun. I'm breaking the rules, teacher. And then of course you get entirely stuck and you don't end up anywhere. And most importantly, it's fun. And this is more, um, more deep than you think. So the fact that it is fun excludes a lot of things. So we think programming is fun and you need to learn programming because you really have to like programming. You have to be born for programming. You have to be interested in programming in a young at a young age. And what most people, most programmers especially, don't think is fun is being told what to do. If you're a programmer, you tell people what to do. You tell computers what to do. So this, it should be fun in the context of learning very often means don't, don't tell me what to do. I'm exploring by myself. I'm learning alone. I want to have fun by trying out stuff and not listening to boring lectures. So it says a lot about our community that we tell children that uh, programming is hard. You'll make many mistakes, but this will be fun because you'll learn from the mistakes. Uh, break some rules, but also there are secret rules you cannot break. And you should like this thing, otherwise you're not meant for programming. So that's the vibe that we project at children and not just at children. This is also very relevant to how we see ourselves and our own learning process, as we will see later on in this talk. Um, and as I said, it's not just me. Many people in our community have learned programming at a really, really young age. So 85% of professionals in the workforce today learned programming before the age of 19. So even though uh, many people my age learned programming when they were young, this stereotype is still propagating um, even in the workforce today, which also includes many people way younger than I am. So as I said, this leads to a culture in which we have kids and adults that want to learn something just explore by themselves. And this doesn't really work well. This is what I found out in the programming club as well. After a few months, then I realized the kids aren't really, they aren't really <laughs> learning anything. I keep explaining the same things to them. And even though they are exploring and breaking rules, they're not really gaining a deep understanding of what's going on. And then I thought, hmm, I'm a scientist after all. Let's look at what other people have researched. 
There was quite some interesting research about how children acquire skills in programming. This paper, for example, skill progression demonstrated by users in Scratch, showed that children have a really, really high dropout. So if kids start programming, very often they quit after a while. And maybe this is because it is hard and frustrating and you make many mistakes. And what they also found is that children initially pick up some skills, but then after a while, they just sort of flatline. They don't learn new skills. And this was exactly what I also found in my programming club, that after a while, kids just didn't learn more. It was like there was this invisible barrier that they just couldn't break through. Later, now we are now moving to the year 2020, there was a very, very interesting study done by other researchers called If They Build It, Will They Understand It? And this showed that if that kids can use a certain programming concept, that doesn't mean that they also understand and can correctly apply the programming concept. So they create a program, a bit like some professional programmers also sometimes do, copy pasting from the internet and looking what other people are doing. And then they do get some sort of solution. But if you then quiz them in what actually is happening there, they don't really understand the details of the projects that they made themselves. Eh? It sounds familiar maybe for some practitioners in some situations also. But I didn't know that. So bloop, we have to go back to 2013. The kids in my club were stuck and I didn't really know how to help them advance. And this is at the point where I really, really got interested to learn more about teaching. As I said, I didn't really know that much about teaching, but I got really, really motivated because these kids were voluntarily coming to a programming club on their free Saturday afternoons. So if they weren't learning, then it was, it was me, right? I couldn't say, oh, these kids aren't motivated because they came, they showed up and then I didn't teach them anything. So as I said, I then got, was really, really interested in learning how people learn anything. And the remainder of this talk will be mainly some of the highlights I learned from diving into how people learn things. Specifically, I studied mainly how people learn natural languages, how people learn to read. And what I found from that is that, interestingly enough, we don't really teach reading code. So I had these kids in my class and it was like, hey, teacher, this is a program I made last week. I don't really remember how it works. Can you, can you help me understand what I built last week? Or can you help me understand this code that I found on YouTube? And it's like, <laughs> I, I don't even know how to read that. I don't really know how to help you. So I would say things like, hey, child, what do you think it does? Right? Never be afraid to mess around and experiment. I don't want to tell you what the answer is. That would not be fun if I would spoil the answer for you. You have to figure it out for yourself. And actually reading this is quite hard because at least in the linear textual program, you could read like from top to bottom, but this is event-based. So how do you even go about reading this? I don't even know. I don't have a great strategy. So then kids got really frustrated if I said, what do you think? Because they were like, well, I don't know, teacher. This is why I'm asking you. And if you compare that to how we teach natural languages, then we don't say to children, if a child says, hey, 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 mom, what does this word say? You didn't say, what do you think it says? This is so not useful. You're going to break down the problem in small steps, right? You'll say, hey, do you know that first letter? It's also the first letter of the alphabet. Maybe you re recognize it. It's like, oh, yeah, the letter A. And then do you see that the second and the third, it's the same letter? You're really guiding them through this. And this is not just for reading, actually. Also for all sorts of other occupations like sports and music. You also don't say, you don't say to your child, hey, child, do you want to learn to play the guitar? Use a guitar. Never be afraid to mess around and experiment. <laughs> tring, tring. <laughs> right? You break problems into small pieces. You, you explain all the snares and what they do. And if your kid wants to learn tennis and you say, okay, this is a backhand and a forehand and this is a net and here's some, some basics. But we never really teach reading code. Not to children, also not to students that I teach at the university. It's not really in the curriculum. We don't, we don't really have good models. 
we don't really practice code reading either. If, we're, if, if we advance to the level of professionals, like most of you are, when is the last time you have practiced reading code? Research shows that pro professional programmers spend almost 60% of their time reading code. So reading, comprehending, searching through code, all sorts of activities that are engaging with code, but not writing code. But as a culture, and you, maybe you wonder, like, why is she talking about all those books for children? Because it so much influences everything also that we believe about our profession as professional programmers. Because what we believe is that by exploring, that by trying out stuff, we will, we will get better, right? We have this thing where we say, oh, if you want a new programming language, if you want to learn a new programming language, you should just build something in that programming language. If you want to get better at programming, you have to have this Saturday open source hobby. We really have as a culture always equated getting better at programming with doing more actual programming. Okay. This never be afraid to mess around and experiment vibe. For example, in December every year, there's the advent of code. It's really nice, of course, the advent of code, but it is, we, we practice by writing small programs. But you could have also, of course, advance by <laughs> reading code. And if you want to learn a second programming language, there are many, many different things you can do uh, apart from start ri writing code in that language that are uh, 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 arguably a, a bit more effective. So we don't teach code. This is where it starts. And this is, starts where I also teach at university. I'm not saying that professionals don't do it right. But then this continues into practice where we don't really practice code reading either. And then, of course, an issue arises because imagine we do want to teach and practice reading code. How do you even read code? What even, what even happens if you read code? So we don't really have theories for reading code. But luckily, there's lots and lots of theories for reading natural language. And more and more research is showing that what happens in your brain if you process natural language is sort of similar to what happens in your brain if you process a programming language. So we can take existing natural language models and apply them to programming to gain an understanding of how programming works. For example, diving into models that we have for natural language processing or actually for processing information in general, if information comes into your brain, usually through your eyes or your ears or your other senses, then firstly, this information is short uh, stored in the short term memory. That's where information comes in first. And this is a bit like a cache. So it, it comes into, into the cache and it stays there briefly. And with briefly, I mean really, really briefly and only a little bit of information. We've already known since the 1950s from a researcher called George Miller that your short term memory is very tiny in size. It can only hold between five and nine things at the same time. So that's super tiny. You cannot remember more than five, between five and nine elements. And, and you, I guess you know this, if, you, um, if someone reads a phone number to you over the phone and you don't have pen and paper, then you know, five, three, four, one, six, that's sort of the, the maximum things you can remember. And to demonstrate to you how short your short-term memory is and how small your short-term memory is, I'm going to show you a sentence very briefly, and it is your goal to try to remember as much of that sentence as you possibly can. So are you ready for the small quiz? It will go very quickly, so you really have to pay attention. Here we go. So that was probably more than fit in your short-term memory. That really, really, really went quickly. And then maybe when, when I said a sentence is going to be shown, you're like, well, hey, that wasn't a sentence. That wasn't even letters. This is unfair. And you would be right because it isn't just your short-term memory that plays a role. Your short-term memory sends information to the working memory where really the thinking happens, where, where information is processed. And your working memory also takes in information from your long-term memory. So your working memory isn't operating with your short-term memory alone. More information in your long-term memory is going to help you remember and process new information quicker. And we'll see how that goes by doing a second quiz. Again, I will show a sentence to you very briefly, and it is your goal to re remember it. Here we go. 
So that was easier, right? At least you had a few. You could pro probably reproduce a few letters now because at least there was something that you remembered. And we'll do another one just to show you that you can actually do this. It isn't a tricky question because your brain is definitely able to remember such a short sentence if you see it only very briefly. Here we go. So that was way easier, right? I guess most of you saw that that was Cat Loves Cake. And that is because those concepts are retrieved from your long-term memory. You're not remembering, oh, uh, half a circle and a circle with a squiggly and a Catholic cross and then a stripe. That doesn't make sense. Immediately, you read the letters, you see the word, and you think of the concept of a cat. And this is all in your long-term memory. So the more information you have in your long-term memory, the easier it is to process something. And this is also why it isn't necessarily so useful to read lots of unfamiliar code. If you don't have any mental model yet, it is better to build some understanding first. This is also why we teach, if we teach reading to kids, we don't just give them sentences and they're like, hey, figure it out, kids. You do the alphabet first and you practice that a while because you need to have a base level of knowledge. Knowing this, knowing just a little bit of what happens in your brain if you read code will help you understand why reading code is so hard. Let's apply this knowledge that we've just learned concretely into the programming space. So let's look at three different programs. Here's a program in a programming language called APL, which means a programming language. This is a very old vector-based programming language. I'm just going to assume most of you don't know APL, so you're confused, right? You don't, you don't know what this does. So there's a certain level of confusedness here. And you are confused because you, you don't know what that T is. You just don't know the meaning of that. This is a long-term memory issue, right? No one has ever explained to you what APL is and how this, this symbol works. You just don't know. And that's a specific way to be confused, right? It's like you are in France and you're looking at a menu in French and you're like, I don't know what the meaning of things is. There's a clear solution also. You look up the meaning of the things that are there. You look up the meaning of the T symbol in APL. Here's another form of confusion in a different program. Here we have a program in Java. I'm going to guess most of you are familiar with Java, but for a minute, assume that you're not so familiar with Java then there's a lot of things that are going to flood your short-term memory. You have to go like public class, public static, void, main, int, system, out, print line, integer. And you don't really know, is this important, right? Because you don't know the structure of the language so much. And, and the real thing, the, the actual thing that is happening is the two binary string. That is what's happening, but it is surrounded by so much information that you might not get it. You might not be able to process everything at once. So this is a short-term memory issue. There's so much information that you don't really know what is relevant and you're, you might hit the limit of your short-term memory before you actually hit the relevant information. Here's a third program. This is a program in BASIC. This program, sure, you need to have a little bit of understanding of what happens here, what, what is let, what is for, what is next. You also need, of course, to remember what is there. But then there's yet another form of confusion. Why is this program so hard? Because you can't immediately see what the relationship between things is, right? You have to go almost, you take your finger or a pen, you go like, huh, well, what does this do? Uh, okay, what if n is 7? Okay, then n2 is 3. Okay, so then that is n, min, uh, n minus n2. Okay, so this is the string 0. You have to figure out what's there because it's hard to see the relationships. This program is hard on your working memory. You have to really do thinking to understand this program. Whereas with Java, if you see the two binary string, you're like, oh, I get it. You don't have to do any thinking. You just have to reach it and remember it. So here you see that a good model, a little bit of understanding of how your brain processes information is really helpful in self-diagnosing why certain programming code is so hard to read. And it's such a pity that people find code hard to read because it often leads to this idea that writing some, rewriting something yourself is going to be easier. 
you find a sort of library on GitHub and you're like, oh, this does exactly what I, what I want, but hmm, oh, this is so complex. I don't really know what this does. Well, never mind, right? I will just write everything myself, which maybe isn't a quicker solution. And especially in a context where you're in a, you work in a team, someone has written code and you're like, well, I don't really understand this. Let me just rewrite some parts of it. That's just very expensive and annoying. And of course you can get better at reading, right? It isn't like code reading is necessarily hard. It's just like reading natural language isn't necessarily hard. Like for a second, appreciate your own brain, right? Isn't it amazing that you can just look at these totally random characters and your brain can just read them. That isn't because you're special. That's just because you put in lots and lots of effort to be able to acquire that skill. This is the same for reading code. You can definitely get better at it with relative ease if you just practice it and focus on it a bit more. So before we uh, open up the floor for questions, I want to show you a few, briefly a few techniques that you can use if you want to get better at reading code. Because these different uh, confusions that I just showed to you have different solutions also. Uh, if you don't know what a certain symbol means, if you don't know what a certain syntax concept means, then of course you can help your long-term memory by practice. You can practice syntax. A great way to pick up new syntax is to make what is called flashcards. So on one side of the card you put the, in, in case you were learning APL, you put the symbol and then on the other side you put the name. Or if you're learning Java while well, you already know C Sharp, you put C Sharp on one side and you put Java on the other side and you just practice syntax to build a larger vocabulary of syntax. If you have a working memory issue, like the basic program I just showed you, you can do things to support your working memory. And for example, you can create something called a state table. Instead of just scribbling on code or taking your debugger, right, and stepping through the code, you can systematically analyze code and there's techniques for this as well. Where you say, okay, in the initialization phase, if n is seven, then these are the values that each variable has. This is the next step and this is the next step. That can help your working memory. You don't have to fit everything in your brain. You can offload a bit of your brain to paper. Of course, this doesn't have to be paper. This can be embedded into the IDE as well. But conceptually, at least you're offloading it outside of your brain. So you can get better at code reading if you understand why you are confused and what the techniques are to be less confused. Another great technique that you can use to gain a deeper understanding also of your own understanding is look at a certain piece of code. Basically, it's just what we did with the sentences, but a little bit longer. So you look at a piece of code for a while, a few minutes, and then you take it away. And then you try as best to reproduce the code. And you will see that that will help you to understand your own understanding because some of these things, the ones highlighted here, will come from your long-term memory, right? You know that in Java, it's something starts with public class and, and a for loop is for int is i. You don't have to remember that this, the individual syntax elements. You can just think, oh, a for loop over the array and you can reproduce it later from your long-term memory. So the more you can reproduce, the easier you can reproduce something, the better your understanding of code already is. Another technique, the, the technique that I really, really like and that I very often use also if I give workshops within companies in, in code reading is to summarize code. And this is a technique also that we use in uh, in teaching languages, right? If you're in high school, if you have a high schooler at home, you will know that very often they are asked to uh, read a newspaper article for five minutes and then give a summary of the newspaper article. Like what are the highlights? What are the most important points here? This is a skill that you have to practice. This isn't something you are magically born with. You can just practice this and you can deliberately ask yourself questions like, what is the goal? What, are, what is the most important piece of this code? Why is it written in the way it is written? These are all techniques that you can practice um, and get better at so that you can do them later on sort of automatically without thinking about it. 
So if you want to know more, this was just a very brief overview of how much it can help you to understand your brain to become a better programmer. You could read my book. It is called The Programmer's Brain. It is on uh, uh, by the publisher Manning. I have a link to the book at the end of the at the end of the talk. It is not available in print yet, but it is available as an ebook. So you can already buy it, and then you can start reading the full book. It is available straight away, and then you can even pre-order if you want to pre-order the print book, and then it will be available available somewhere, uh, somewhere in the summer. What you could also do, and what's really, really fun, is you can start a code reading club at work. So together with Katja Mordaunt, I've been piloting code reading club. So these are people that come together and they use techniques like summarizing code and remembering code and discussing about codes to deliberately practice their code reading skills. We have some free resources about code reading club. I also put them at the, in the latest, uh, at the end of the talk. So that's definitely something that we have found to be very, very useful as a way also of building your team, building a knowledge base in a team while also deliberately practicing code reading skills. So that's it. That's the end. We have a, a bit of time for Q&A, but just before I want to summarize my entire talk in like 30 seconds, because I know for me it's late, for some of you it might be late, and I tend to speak a bit quickly. So I have a very brief summary for you so that you're optimally prepared for asking questions. We talked about how to read code, because as a field, we very much have this culture where Getting better at programming means programming, interacting with code, engaging with code in the IDE, rather than other ways of learning as other fields do have. And we know that just programming isn't really working for kids so well, and most likely it's not so efficient for adults as well, because we know from how people process all sorts of information, including code, that your long-term memory really, really helps your short-term memory. So just diving in without any long-term memory knowledge base is just not so likely to be very helpful. If you know a little bit about these memory models and you can better self-diagnose what happens in your brain if you're confused and sometimes the solution is learning more code and sometimes the solution is helping you process very complex and very intermingled code and there are many techniques that we can use from natural language reading for example summarizing code and remembering code as a diagnostic tool if you want to know more about me as i said i'm on twitter at as at feline my website is feline.com, so that's very easy. Just if you know how to spell my first name, you can easily find me. I'm also a host of SE Radio, one of the biggest software engineering podcasts on the web. We're on Spotify and iTunes for free also. So if you want to know more about software engineering, that's a great resource. If you want to know more about my book, you can simply go to feline.com slash book. Very easy with a direct link uh, where you can start reading straight after this talk if you want to. And if you're interested to start a programming club, we have some free resources about code reading clubs on felina.com slash club. And with that, I think we can go over to questions. <laughs>